This video is brought to you by EVGA and the Z15 mechanical keyboard. 4 kilohertz poll rate, 70 million rated key switches, all the cool stuff you'd expect. You should definitely check it out, but this is the coolest part. Yeah, okay, removable keycaps. Nah, removable key switches. So if for some reason you don't want your left arrow to be clicky, not a problem. You just pull the switch and replace it. But I've also got new key switches because EVGA is doing it right. You can check the link below to check out this keyboard. Also get a pretty steep discount if you join Elite. There's all kinds of, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Switch Clicky, that's the uh, KLH, K-A-I-L-H switches. And also in the box are eight extra non-clicky switches. So you can swap out, you know, control and alt or escape or whatever if you don't want something super clicky. Thanks EVGA and on with the video. I've got my soldering iron, my soldering basket. As the title and thumbnail have no doubt given away, we're going to build a computer. All right, so this machine was from Digital Electronics Corporation. This is a model, but it's a working model with blinking LEDs. And uh, yeah, it's a glorified Raspberry Pi hat, basically. And it's a working model that'll run Fortran 77 and Advent and Star Trek and Zork. We're gonna build it. All right, so you can buy these as a kit online. This is a sort of a miniature version of the front panel of the PDP-11. And you can kind of see it's got some, some transparent areas here. It's designed for uh, LEDs, some switches on the front. This is where things got interesting. The PDP-11 is old enough you know, it has its roots in the 60s, although it was manufactured mostly in the 70s and sold through the 1990s. So that's a pretty long time for the lifetime of a computer. It has its roots in old school computers where you would like flip switches, but it was the first computer fast enough to run a modern multi-user Unix system. And a lot of the stuff that went into Unix drives a lot of the philosophy today that we see in Linux and even Mac OS. So in the kit, you get this cool front panel you get the switch spacers which actually tells you which color <laughs> which color goes where then you get a bag of uh, LEDs resistors there's even a key switch because computers required a key to operate in the past this little helpful thing which helps you get your LED spacing just right this is a back panel which you can wire it up with RS-232 RS-485 and other, uh, other interfaces as you see fit. There's also the printed circuit board, which has a, an ample prototyping area, so you could you know, do fun stuff with that. Got a bag of switches, <laughs> mostly red and purple, a few white ones in there. A lovely injection molded case. Oh, and there was a block of wood in the box, but uh, I'm gonna upgrade that on my own. So how I'd suggest you start is just, you know, I've got some, some little random parts bins for keeping things separated. <laughs> There are parts that want to roll away and escape. So just, just beware. That is a lot of passive components. A lot of LEDs, a lot of diodes, fair number of resistors. There's a lot of stuff here. <laughs> Here's the keys to your new computer, which ironically did cost more than a car in the 70s. Oh, it's already wanted to get away. So the little plastic things, the way that they go on the LEDs is you put them in the open end first and try to get the long lead through and then just sort of push them on and then there you go. That's sort of what you end up with. So there's one, two, 64, 65. Now, now that I've got everything sort of separated, I've got my key lock and then my turnstiles. Got a bunch of diodes. These are not reversible. And a bunch of resistors. These are reversible. And there's a bunch of different switches in here. There's red ones and purple ones, but some of them are momentary and some of them are toggle switches. They'll stay in their own state. There's also an orientation. So like, oops, that's upside down. The next thing I would do is find my momentary switches. So I got my pile of momentary switches and I got my pile of regular switches. We're basically ready to solder. And I thought about how I want to do this and I think I want to start with the diodes. Some people, you got to bend the leads to do this and you got to get the orientation correct. So you got to pay close attention to the printed circuit board. It has a little line, which way the black side goes. It's one side, it's not, it's asymmetrical, you know. You want to make sure that you also do it in the correct side. So you should see the PDP 1170. When you put in the diodes, 
You can do it a couple of different ways. You can put them all in and then just use tape to hold them down. That's perfectly fine. I like to just bend the LED or bend the leads. Uh, I've got a practice hand. Just go slow if it is your first rodeo. Now I like to do this kind of thing in sections. So you, you put them in and then you sort of do all the soldering at once. I mean, you could put them in one at a time and solder them, but don't recommend that. And I especially don't recommend that for the LEDs. Just remember to get your, your diode alignment correct. Put it in backwards, it won't work. It's gonna take a couple of soldering passes, several in fact, to do this correctly. The thing that you look for in soldering is basically just to make sure that the solder sort of gets sucked down in the hole a little bit. You kind of want to heat the board and the pad. You don't want to overheat the diode. You want to heat the board more than the diode. I don't know, it takes a little bit of practice. I'm not pre-trimming the wires. The wires act a little bit like a heat sink, which is pretty good. And they also help you a little bit if you put too much solder on, you can sort of wick it up the lead and make the, uh, the connection a little cleaner. Then when you're ready, I find it's helpful to have these uh, side angle cutters. It makes it really easy to trim these. If you're wondering where to trim, don't trim all the way against the printed circuit board. Trim where the little bead of solder ends, basically. So it's gonna be a little above the top of the board. Okay, so there's two resistors in the kit. Uh, 1K or 820 ohms in, in my kit, and then uh, 390 ohms. So in my kit, the 690 ohm ones were these. These little tiny, 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 tiny things. These resistors go in the 1K spot. Now the 1Ks are sprinkled all around the board, but the 390s are all sort of in the middle of the board, so it makes it pretty easy. Now we just solder the resistors in. Now the next thing that I think I'm gonna solder is the socket for the integrated circuit, which goes here. This is actually one where it would be useful to hold it in place with tape, but I usually just bend the opposite pins a little bit. Use that to hold it in place, works fine. Now we need to solder the socket for the Raspberry Pi. And it does not go on the front like everything else. It goes on the back because the Raspberry Pi is hidden behind the scenes. It's like the man behind the curtain. The connector orientation doesn't matter itself. Sometimes these connectors, they'll actually have one pin that is a square or a circle or pin one is marked in some way on the connector. You wanna get it in perfectly straight because that one pin sets the tone for the entire rest of the connector. Now the next thing to solder are the LEDs. The wonderful, wonderful LEDs that I've already pre-assembled. And they're all oriented the same way, so you can't mess that up. Shove it through, and the spacers have the correct spacing, and you're good to go. Ooh, it's like watching paint dry. 65, look at that. It's glorious. All right, now I gotta look at the back here, make sure I didn't screw any of the pins up. I'm gonna go ahead and install the microcontroller. These little micros have a tendency to splay, so you wanna kinda of make it at a right angle, just very, very slight, very slight bending. You just push it down into the socket and you're good to go. With that in place, you can also use this as a guide, check and make sure that your polarity is correct on all your LEDs. The last things I'll solder before we get to testing will be these rotary switches. You'll wanna sort of bend them against the desk to straighten them out. Get them nice and straight, and then they only go in one way. Ooh, they want to bend out of the way. Make sure they go in perfectly straight. Rotary switches with hidden clickers. Probably could go ahead and install the uh, nylon standoffs as well. Come off without too much headache. It's very easy to cross thread nylon standoffs in general, so just be careful when you're tightening this down. Hand tight, don't use tools. Whew, it's starting to look like a supercomputer from the 1970s. Excellent. Pretty sure that means we're ready for testing. To prepare the Raspberry Pi, they've got a pretty good guide. You basically just set up Raspbian, and then there's a tar GZ file that you download and install, and it's in the guide for this. So if you need help with that, I guess come to the level one forums, but it's pretty straightforward. The Raspberry Pi is raspberried with Pi. Uh, the installation manual recommends a bit of electrical tape on the metal bits here because uh, it's dangerously close to the PCB. I can accommodate that, it's a reasonable request. And then just mash the raspberry down onto the, uh, onto the printed circuit board. Now let's plug it into power and see what happens. Hey, LEDs. 
All right, all the LEDs are on because it thinks the lamp test switch is toggled. We can see that uh, the LEDs are working correctly. If I can, there we go. So now it's like, is the rotator switch working correctly? Yes. Rotator switch. Nice. So this is basically the conclusion of the test. Looks straight out of War Games, doesn't it? The Whopper. <laughs> it's so exciting. All right, with all of our tests complete, there's this thing. This is a kind of cheat sheet to deal with your switches. So there's, there's the larger holes and the smaller holes. The smaller holes we're literally gonna zip tie to the switches and the larger holes we're gonna use as a guide and it's a permanent installation. This is only used temporarily and then you throw it away. This tells us what kind of switch to put in. It has little labels on it. So like red toggle, purple toggle. So the ones at the end sort of control what's happening and the other ones control, you know, the address or data that you're loading in. And then this thing, you basically slip on like this and then use the included zip ties to turn this into basically one assembly. Now, because these switches do melt easily, I'm gonna recommend that you go long ways instead of short ways. That way you're not soldering all three connections on one switch at the same time. Also try to use the iron to touch the pad instead of the pin and get the pad super hot and then touch the pin at the last second to get the solder to reflow onto both. With that soldered <laughs> and the keys reasonably straight, reasonably, we can go ahead and cut the zip ties. Now the only other gotcha is with the key switch. If you look closely, there's a lot of printing on the back. If you bear down on the back here, you'll scratch up the front and this is held in place with a nut. So I'd recommend a little piece of paper or something. Definitely don't smash it into the table and scratch the bejesus out of it. I like to take a little piece of electrical tape, just cut a V out of it. Ta-da! It's a hole. I strongly not recommend pliers because you will damage the back of this. And now our key lock is in place. When you place the front in the plastic case, these standoffs with the nut pre-installed, or not pre-installed, you, you installed it, and you just sort of line it up and then tighten it down. With your fingers, not a tool. Looking pretty fabulous. All right, for the actual panel installation, you gotta sort of pre-thread the screws and also put nuts on them because these are a little bit more spacing. It's very important, these nuts, you don't want them to be tight. You actually want them to be loose, about a millimeter off the bottom of the board so that when you're tightening this in, the nut doesn't snag. Nice. Now all that's left is to install the rotary switches, which have a little flathead set screw, and you'll wanna tighten it down so that it clears the panel because there is a push button in these, and you wanna be able to push the button. <laughs> it lives. With everything confirmed working in our, our uh, you know, PDP-11 image correctly loaded, the blinking lights program, that's basically what this is, which the sole job is to blink the lights. But you know, I can actually uh, flip some switches here and load, it's hard to do it backwards. Flip some switches and actually load another operating system. That's how it actually works. You can actually hit the halt switch, halt execution, and then specify an address, jump to that address, and it'll immediately start executing. There's one other part that you have to deal with and that's the wood block. So it comes with a completely unfinished wood block. Uh, for mine, special walnut finish for that little something special. <laughs> and there we are, the finished special walnut project. Yeah, now you can see it a little better. Behold, the finished PDP-11, one of the first and earliest computers that could run what we consider a modern Unix. Very exciting. And also the blinking lights are nice. This has been me building a PDP-11. If you really have to have this, there's a link below. It's a uh, planned obsolescence. I paid for mine. They didn't send it or anything. I just kind of like the idea of having this maybe in, a, in the background of a set or something. All right, I'm on this level one. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.